chapter 12. It's interesting. This morning in my quiet time, I read Numbers chapter 11. And that's where this morning's message started. And uh, then it continued into Revelation chapter 12. And so if you were here this morning, you got the short run. And, uh, and Phil and I were talking about that before he preached it. And I said, don't take anything out on the count of the fact that that's where we're going tonight. If we get it twice, we understand it twice as well. We don't want to not understand it. We want to understand it better. And uh, so praise the Lord for that. Um, I don't think the Lord has, uh, makes mistakes in these things. We, we get these things that help us. Uh, and uh, strengthen our understanding of the scriptures. And uh, at the end of the day, that's what we really want to happen. We want to understand the word of God and, and to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. We want to be able to discern. Uh, you don't want my opinion. You don't want people's opinion. You want what God says. You want what's absolute. Because then it's absolutely trustworthy. And we want to build on those things. So we're going to read through Revelation 12. If you'd be standing with me, we'll uh, read through the entire chapter and, and get a little bit of the picture there. <clears throat> Revelation and chapter 12 in the first verse. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has pre uh, a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and sixty days, well, three score days. Uh, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood." And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood with the dragon, uh, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Why don't we pray, shall we? We're thankful, our Lord, for the Word of God. We ask that you would give us good comprehension of it. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to uh, recognize the truths we've already considered. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to be able to place the truths that we read of. And, Lord, we ask that you'd bless our uh, consideration of your Word with personal 
challenge and growth this evening. And so we look for your blessings and ministry to our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're looking this evening at the subject of the woman, the child and the dragon. It almost sounds like the title of a book, doesn't it? The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe or something like that. I don't know uh, where these things come from. But uh, uh, these are <coughs> the three main players of our text. And uh, what we want to do th uh, this evening is just consider what is God trying to teach us as he gives us this, uh, these pictures What's his agenda? What's going on here? And um, uh, what does he want for us to learn from it? And hopefully we'll learn some things as we go there. Uh, again, some of these pictures, uh, as with the pictures that I use regularly, uh, they're whatever I can find that best describes what's given in the scriptures. And uh, some of them may have different histories that uh, we wouldn't agree with. So uh, the pictures are just for... Uh, visual understanding. But um, uh, Phil looked this morning at the subject of the woman and uh, the definition of who she is and those things. And uh, so we want to do the same this evening and build on the back of what he was able to look at. And uh, so there are a lot of interesting concepts that people get when they look at this. Uh, we've also looked at the subject of the three women of Revelation. Um, Revelation speaks of three specific women. One of them would be, as the picture here identifies, the Bride of Christ. Uh, in Revelation 19, we'll read of the Bride of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb, where the Bride, who uh, the Scriptures identifies as the Church, I speak concerning Christ and His Church, uh, we have the wonderful picture there of uh, what's coming for the church of Jesus Christ. We remember Jesus said, I uh, will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. He's talking to the bride uh, as uh, being embraced, uh, not at the marriage proper, but at the marriage ceremony. And uh, then uh, enjoying um, and living happily ever after, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wonderful picture there of the bride of Christ in the book of Revelation. We also uh, looked at the woman riding the beast and uh, this speaks of mystery Babylon and uh, with different pictures this one represented um, of the EU uh, with the different uh, nations included. I want you to notice something about this though as we uh, move into what we're actually studying and uh, that is the, uh, uh, the flag that she carries being a 12 star flag. Now we, are, we know as we've uh, looked in times past and as we are familiar with scripture that the, the, uh, the United Nations as it stands in Revelation and Daniel will be a 10 nation confederacy in end time Rome uh, overruled by the, uh, the Antichrist or the beast. Um, so he will rise up over those 10 nations and rule them. So why do we have 12? Well, we identified uh, last week as we looked at the, uh, uh, this subject specifically that there are nations coming and going uh, to the EU as it stands and uh, whether it is the EU specifically or whether it is uh, another like um, emphasis there will be the ten nations that will be there um, at the time of uh, the Antichrist. So why do they put twelve? Is it because there were twelve at the time of its making? I don't believe that's the reason why. Uh, I believe there's something else about those twelve stars. In fact, it's a confusion of the woman riding the beast in Revelation chapter 17 and uh, 18 and the woman that we see here in Revelation chapter 12 and what we have is a misrepresentation of the 12 stars that are over the head of the, um, the woman in Revelation chapter 12 and so there's a little bit of a confusion the devil 
is the master of confusion. He'll get a little bit of this and a little bit of that and put them together and you don't know where you are and you're lost. And then uh, interpretations are up to, well, whoever can come up with the fanciest interpretation or the most likely sounding interpretation might be the winner of the competition. Um, we don't want to go down that path. We want to see what God has to say and accept that as our authority. We then get the, uh, the other concept of the third woman, whom the Bible says is uh, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 12, she's clothed with the sun, the moon is under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now those who were there uh, uh, here this morning um, heard the emphasis that this will very likely conjure up the concept of the Queen of Heaven as she is presented, uh, or the whole concept of Mary Altry and the worship of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all of these things. And uh, you can see, even with the way she holds her hands, the hands being the hands that bore the, uh, the pain and suffering of our redemption, that's our Lord's uh, endeavor, and this is emphasizing the Queen of Heaven as the co-redeemer. This is a blasphemous picture. And... Um, uh, but does this rightfully represent Revelation 12? No, it doesn't. It, it misrepresents her. But we've got the concepts that are written here, but uh, di presented differently. Um, so what is uh, Revelation 12 and what is it all talking about? Well, let me give you some, some ideas. Um, hmm, that's an interesting set of notes. They're not my notes that I'm after. All right. Well, I won't give you a quote. Mary Baker Eddy made a statement. In my other notes. And uh, she made a statement basically that suggested God presented himself to man. And uh, we see in the Lord Jesus the presentation of God in his manhood. And so that we can understand God. Jesus represents God in his manhood. But she said, well, God created man and woman in Genesis, so wouldn't it be appropriate for the other side of God to be seen? Now, that's a problem in itself. It's a misrepresentation of God himself. So she said, the representation of God in his womanhood is seen in me. And Mary Baker Eddy presents herself as the woman of Revelation chapter 12. And uh, she is God manifest to be worshipped and recognized. And she is the queen of heaven, uh, as it were, represented in Revelation chapter 12. And uh, she has much more to say on the subject and others referring to her blasphemously suggest that she is the woman of Revelation 12 in her representation of God and uh, her placing herself as the equivalent of the Lord Jesus in that state. Um, uh, we don't want to um, accept uh, any of these things, but what we... Uh, see as we look at concepts like that is exactly what the study was about this morning and that is if you're not tied to the scriptures for definition then you're open to your imagination for interpretation it can come from anywhere and of course we don't want to go there a number of years ago there were people who said um, there's a planetary lineup all happening if you look at what's happening, this is 2017, uh, all the planets are lining up and it's the fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation chapter 12. And I looked at Revelation chapter 12 and thought there's no prophecy about planets lining up in Revelation 12. But here it is. Um, as you look up in the sky, those who follow their, uh, their star signs and I don't, but uh, you'll recognize Virgo and Leo. Uh, Leo the lion, 
Virgo the Virgin as uh, two of the star constellations that are in the sky. Now, on a given date in 2017, there was the alignment of the moon along with the sun with some of the other heavenly bodies, Mercury here, sorry, uh, Jupiter here, Mercury, Venus, and so on. And uh, all of these things, in their suggestion or understanding, identifying the woman, the virgin. Does it say in this passage it was a virgin? No, there's probably a little bit of an assumption that this speaks of Mary as the mother of because the word virgo or virgin emphasizing her and uh, the word Jupiter emphasizing the child. So here's a woman they suggest with child with the sun behind her and the moon at her feet and the rest of the uh, planets there emphasizing her glory. Some have even gone as far as representing 12 different stars and heavenly bodies here to represent the 12 stars on her head. Now, I think their whole objective is unbiblical. God didn't want us reading the stars to find out about prophecy. What did he want us to read to find out about prophecy? Thus saith the Lord. Did he hide his word in here so we can't find it? Or did he tell us in plain words so that we can understand it and find it? He gave it to us in plain scripture, in plain words, in black and white, for the purpose of understanding. Now, some things were hidden from those who refused to believe. But God's word is that we might know truth. His whole intent is that we would know truth. If all of these things happened, people back in 2017 were saying, the Lord is going to come. This is the end. Um, it didn't even say in the passage about the Lord coming. We're actually trying to put words in God's mouth. We're trying to make it say things that it just plainly never said. Well, let's have a look at the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and the dragon that is her great opposition. Uh, I want you to think about these things as we see them in the scriptures. We know the story, uh, as Phil mentioned again this morning, of Genesis chapter 37. And Joseph, remember Joseph, one of the uh, sons of Jacob, uh, was beloved of his father, and uh, he gave him the coat of many colors, uh, and of course, uh, Joseph then went out and he had a dream. The dream was, well, I had a sheaf. We were out there collecting the hay and I had a sheaf. And then all of a sudden, my sheaf stood up and all of your sheaves, he says to his brothers, they fell down and bowed down to my sheaf. And uh, you can imagine that Joseph's brothers weren't very impressed, were they? You expect us to bow down before you. You think you're some hotshot, don't you? Um, so Joseph went and he spoke with his father. You remember the story. And his dad said, um, you told your brothers that. <laughs> well, that's not very wise, is it? Uh, obviously, you're not going to get any brownie points with your brothers telling them they're going to worship you. And uh, quite frankly, I think it's a bit conceited of you to think that of yourself. So Joseph went back. Maybe they thought he'd had too much sun. He'll get over it. And uh, he has another dream. And in his second dream, he dreams of the sun and the moon and the 11 stars falling down to bow before him. And he shares that with his dad. And wow, dad says, you're in real strife now. You're not going to win any brownie points with that. And his brothers, well, they hated him. And when they saw him coming, what did they do with him? They sold him into slavery, didn't they? They hated him because of his suggestion that the sun representing his father, the moon representing his mother, and the, the stars representing his brethren would fall, fall down and worship him. We see the identification from Joseph's uh, interpretation of the dream there that 
he understood what God was telling him of the future. God was revealing the future to Joseph, as he later would do in further times with Pharaoh's dream and so on. And, uh, but what we do see and what's relevant to Revelation is the identification of the 12 tribes of Israel and uh, the parentage of uh, such, we see the nation of Israel represented here. So when we see a woman who is clothed with the sun, um, we just go back there a little bit, with the moon under her feet uh, and the 12 uh, stars there, uh, we see a clear identification of Israel, the nation. Now, uh, if you're going to try and place this as Mary, you're also, you, uh, also going to find that this was the mother of the child. But as uh, was identified this morning also, uh, Israel is clearly the mother of the child Jesus. One of the prime objectives that God had for Israel was to bring Christ into the world. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But th they were his people, the ones that brought the Lord Jesus into the world. And uh, God used Israel to bring Israel into the world, just as today he uses the church to bring Christ to the world. Um, so Israel brought Christ into the world. Uh, the other player we see here is the, the devil. <clears throat> And he's known here as the dragon. Again, identified in the passage, uh, we see the dragon, um, which is uh, stated to be the devil. Verse number nine, the great dragon being cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. Uh, he was cast to the earth. And so we see that the devil hated the Lord Jesus. Now, right from the beginning, the devil has hated Israel. Right from the beginning, the devil has wanted to do away with the Lord Jesus. Right from the prophecy of redemption, the devil has hated the Redeemer and thereby has hated Israel. Right from its uh, outset, the devil has tried to destroy Israel. From the Egyptians taking the Israeli men... Uh, as they were born, the man-child, and throwing them into the Nile to uh, do away with the Israelite nation, uh, the devil hated Israel. From the opposition of nations throughout time, uh, the devil has been fighting against Israel, the, the great dragon. Of course, in time as uh, Christ was to be born, um, as God testified that as to the wise men and others, we find the devil going into overtime to try and deal with this issue of a redeemer to be born. Uh, the, the devil, uh, of course, tried to uh, make it impossible for Mary and Joseph to find a place to, uh, to give birth. After the birth of the child, uh, he brought... Uh, national enmity against the Lord Jesus and uh, Herod would have the children put to death. All of these things uh, was the devil in his hatred and endeavor to do away with God's Redeemer. In this passage we see the great dragon, verse number 3, identified as having seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads and ten horns. Now we saw the beast last week that had seven heads and ten horns. And uh, that was uh, representing the beast. Uh, the seven heads were identified biblically as the mountains on which uh, the woman sat. The horns were identified as the kings. Uh, that uh, would be under the rule of the Antichrist. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the beginning of uh, that beast, uh, he finds his beginning in chapter 13. In chapter 12, though, we see the dragon, the devil, having the control of the seven heads and the ten horns. 
So before the Antichrist has his place there, the devil is already working his agenda uh, with the seven heads and the, gen uh, the ten horns. Uh, he's already working the works of darkness. We might see that with the concept of the mystery of iniquity. He's already at work. Even though the Antichrist is not yet here, many Antichrists abound. Uh, but that's the devil working his work. And so the beast that then comes with seven heads and ten horns, uh, of course, all of those representing uh, very clearly stated things. But we notice here, as the devil is said in this passage to be cast out of heaven and uh, cast to the earth, in Revelation 12 and verse 12, we read, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. He knoweth that he hath but a short time. So the devil comes down with extra fury. When does he come? Well, this is speaking of the revelation uh, period, the tribulation period, uh, as he comes down and uh, uh, unleashes his fury over the earth. Uh, after the rapture of the church, after the Holy Spirit is taken away, after the um, uh, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, after the removal of the Holy Spirit in the local New Testament church, we have the beginning of the tribulation period, the rise of the Antichrist, the rule of the devil here on earth. Uh, all of those things uh, will play their period, uh, play their, their part for their period uh, of seven years there. The emphasis of the passage is very much a Jewish endeavor as we see uh, the devil uh, working over the Antichrist. Uh, we see in the first three and a half years of the uh, tribulation period, Scripture is very clear with the ten nations being established that, the, that Israel can worship in their temple. Of course, until they're put out with the defiling of the temple, central uh, midway through the tribulation period. At that time, Antichrist will reveal himself for who he is. But I want you to notice um, we've got there the emphasis of we've got a short time. While the Seven years is known as the tribulation. The last three and a half years is uh, identified biblically as the great tribulation. The, uh, the emphasis of a short time uh, is uh, focused by the devil and uh, he puts the pressure on Israel. His hatred for Israel is taken to new levels. And uh, so there was a clear direction given to Israel, when you see the abomination of, of desolation stand in, in the holy place, that is, when you see the Antichrist declare that he is God, what was Israel to do? Can anybody remember? Flee to the mountains. It tells us that in Matthew chapter 24. Um, here we see, um, and I've skipped a little bit ahead, but uh, I want you to notice... Here in the passage, and we're going to see it, it's going to come up again. So um, why, don't we, why don't we follow through on some other things before we get to that part. Uh, let's, let's go here. Uh, the Bible says of the child, and we need to identify the child, that the child would be born, um, brought forth by the woman. And so we see in verse number four, halfway through, uh, the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her as soon as it was born. Um, that's the devil's opposition of Israel, the nation, uh, and indeed of the child. She brought forth a man-child, verse 5, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And a child was caught up unto God and to his throne. You notice a couple of things there of the... Uh, the ruling the nations with the rod of iron. Scripture is very clear of Christ coming to rule with the rod of iron. And uh, we see that um, during the millennial kingdom, 
uh, that he comes and rules with a rod of iron. Uh, but then we see his ascension here as he is caught up. So the devil was hostile towards uh, Israel. Then he was hostile towards the Lord Jesus when he was born to the point where he organized to have him put on the cross. And then, of course, the Lord Jesus was caught up to heaven. That's his ascension, isn't it? Now, um, some have suggested ruling with a rod of iron means, well, that was his rod. Uh, if we read the 23rd Psalm, what do we read about a rod? They comfort, the rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And some have said, oh, the Lord Jesus comes in loving comfort and uh, that's him ruling with a rod of iron. That's not really the concept that's given in the scriptures. Scriptures speaks of the shattering of the, uh, the earthen vessels. And he said, the Lord Jesus will rule with a rod of iron as, as pottery is, uh, is uh, broken to shivers. So the Lord will rule during that period. And uh, that's not the loving rule uh, of God dealing with his children. This is the rule of Christ, the Messiah, dealing with those who rebel against him. And uh, that's the lost ones during the millennial kingdom. Um, so again, we get back to the woman um, as the, uh, the devil opposes the nation of Israel. He puts out of his mouth, it says in the passage here, um, waters to destroy her. Um, verse number 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Again, we emphasize that the woman was, as it says in verse number um, uh, verse number 14, that she was to flee into the wilderness. And so we're, we're, we've skipped through some things. She was to flee into the wilderness. So there in the wilderness, she was to stay. It tells us in verse number 14, for time and times and half a time. We've got one time and two times. So that's three and a half, three and a half years. Now, if we relate that back to our uh, understanding of the millennial kingdom, or rather the tribulation period before the millennial kingdom, we know that it was divided in two halves. A time and times and half a time refers to the second half of the tribulation. The first half of the tribulation, Israel worships in her temple. The second half of the tribulation, she flees to the wilderness, to the mountains. There, there are places for her to hide. This is in Qumran, uh, southern Judea, where uh, the, uh, the scrolls of Isaiah were found. And uh, in these mountains that surround this area, there are many different places which could be hiding places for the Jews. Now, there are those people today who fear that Antichrist might be on the, uh, on the border and uh, Christians who are looking for places to hide. They're looking for places in the mountains. They're preparing their, um, their places of security for when Antichrist comes. Well, uh, they're lost, but uh, they're not going to be here. If they're genuinely saved, they're not going to be here during the time of the Antichrist's rule. Uh, believers are taken away before that time. Um, are they preparing it for Israel? Well, no. Israel was to run to the mountains uh, in the Judean wilderness in, um, in um, Matthew chapter 24. And uh, there they were to be nourished, it says here in verse 14, for a time and times and half a time. What we see there is that God enables them to get there and spares the lives of Israel there while many will be put to death. God will spare a remnant which was ultimately God's promise to Israel. Though judgment would fall on them, yet he would spare a remnant of them. And so God will nourish them there in the wilderness. 
That's a pretty amazing thing, isn't it? We think, how can God do that? Maybe we should carry cans out into the, the uh, desert caves and so that there is food for them in the wilderness. Well, our God is able to furnish a table in the wilderness. We saw this morning that uh, when Israel questioned God's capacity and Moses wasn't sure about it, God said, is the Lord's hand shortened that he cannot save? Do you think I can't feed my people in the wilderness? And God could bring all the, uh, the fowls of the air and cause them to fly at a, a reasonable height so they could be captured and eaten and provide food for all of Israel for 30 days with the meat of God's provision. Do you think God can provide for Israel during three and a half years of tribulation? Absolutely he can. God says specifically that God will nourish them. I look at uh, Elijah who likewise was sent by God into the wilderness. Can you remember how long he was there? For three and a half years. And for three and a half years, God would make provision for Elijah, first uh, by the ravens, then by a widow. God would provide in times of great need for his servant uh, as he followed his direction. God says here, Israel will be to flee to the mountains and uh, he will there provide their needs and they will find not only refuge but also provision. This is God's working and God's promise for the sparing of his people. If we weren't sure who the woman was, even the understanding of the woman fleeing to the wilderness for three and a half years where she's preserved of God should connect with so much more scripture that we would have no trouble understanding that this is God working with Israel as he's stated uh, both in Revelation and in uh, Matthew and in Daniel uh, and all of these things. Let's just go back a little bit as we understand a concept here. <clears throat> It's going to be a tough time. The tribulation will find Antichrist in pursuit of Israel to destroy them. And when they are preserved of God, he's going to turn to anybody he can find who he can uh, uh, oppose. Verse number 17, we read, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. To keep the commandments, uh, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So he's going to be uh, out to get whoever he can that holds the testimony of Christ. Look at verse number 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. You say, is that salvation or is that, is that bad or is that good? The devil being cast to the earth, well, that's surely got to be bad. Uh, that's going to bring great uh, trials, uh, which accused them before our God day and night. Or is it good? We read in verse number 11, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And hence the picture here, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And here we, we have... A concept, and I want you to just park here for a little while and think on this concept. God's concept of victory. They overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. These are people who had spiritual victory in their lives because they said, we're not going to give up on truth. Truth is all we have to hang on to. We're going to stand with the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to rest in His work and that only. We're going to stand with Him as our God. We're not going to follow the, uh, the pressures and uh, agendas of the devil here. And so they stood. I want you to notice though where, where it led them. Where did victory lead them? You say that doesn't sound very victorious. That, that verse which speaks of them overcoming the devil, 
goes on and it says, and they loved not their lives unto the death. You know, many of the saints during the tribulation will find complete victory and yet lose their heads for it. The devil hostile against all those who know and love God, who have embraced the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus. Hostile against Israel who brought him into the world and all those who have embraced him will have an agenda to put to death all who know and love him. You wouldn't want to be saved only in the tribulation period, would you? If you had a choice. How much easier to be saved today where we can embrace the redemption of God and thankfully rejoice in it and securely and certainly in our land uh, without persecution we can attest to the fact that we hold to a living Saviour. But in the tribulation period, those who embrace Christ will do so with the endangering of their lives. It makes us aware of the fact that now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. We need to take the opportunity as it stands today because if the Lord came tomorrow and a lost one decided to get saved then, it's going to be a hard time for them. It's going to be a hard time for them. It also refutes the concept that spiritual victory suggests that we enjoy all physical blessing. Now, that's a lie. These people, in the same verse, enjoyed great spiritual victory and yet they paid for it with their lives. They lost their lives. They loved not their lives unto the death. See, what they did was they made a decision. Is it the spirit or is it the flesh? Am I going to preserve my physical life or my spiritual life? What really matters to us? It's the same principle for victory in our lives today. It's a battle for the spirit or the flesh. Do I want to honour God or do I want to serve myself? Where am I at? I can have spiritual victory. It will come at the cost of my own life. For if we hold our own lives, we will lose it. But if we leave that behind to trust Christ, we're actually going to find it. We're going to find the blessings of God. What a challenge to what we might naturally think of as the provisions or the blessings of God in our lives that may come with victory. And so we find that spiritual victory did not necessitate physical blessing. Far from it. Passing through the wilderness, we get to this concept in Daniel 7 and verse 25, speaking of the, uh, the Antichrist there, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be uh, given uh, unto his hand until a time and times and the dividing of a time. Again, the devil has a short time. Here, we're talking about the last three and a half years. Antichrist is going to tighten the screws. He's going to make it very hard for all those who name the name of Christ. But ultimately, the kingdom of Antichrist ruled over the ten nations, the same kingdom, which is the kingdom of the devil at that time, will be destroyed when the Lord Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom on the earth. So, did the devil win the battle? Well, he wins just for a little while, doesn't he? He seems like he's the victor. He can, uh, he can breathe fire and threatenings, and uh, he can make it difficult for Israel, and he can destroy the saints through that period of time. But I want you to just turn over with me to Revelation chapter 20, if you would. 
Revelation chapter 20. And we read, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is called the devil and Satan. This is the same old dragon, isn't it? And bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. Who's laughing now? Who's the victor now? Oh, the devil that thought he was uh, so capable and, and so able to overcome the people of God and indeed to overcome God. No, he's, uh, he's the loser. Oh, but he's only there for a thousand years, right? Well, we come back to, uh, in verse number 10 of that passage, the devil uh, that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Verse number 7 tells us, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed. But then in verse number 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil lost the battle. The devil is a defeated enemy. And what of those who follow him? Well, the passage continues on from verse number 11 and speaks of a great white throne and him that sat on it, who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Of course, that's the Lord Jesus, the judge. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And we see the horrible end of not only the devil, but all those who have followed his deceitful ways, who have followed his deceitful teachings, who have lived for the flesh and for self, who have rejected the only saviour. A horrible end of ultimate destruction, of hellfire, of the lake of fire. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 12 gives a little picture of a hostile enemy that wants to overthrow the works of God and destroy all those who would seek the Lord. Oh, there's going to be a time. He'll have a moment a moment of opportunity to move those who will, those who have already resisted and rejected Christ, to lead them in rebellion. He'll have it again in Revelation chapter 20 at the end of the millennial kingdom. God gives people a chance to make their decision, to make choices, and to say, who will you serve? Is it the God of heaven? Or is it the devil of hell? Who are we going to side with? Who are we going to follow? Who are we going to listen to? We need to be careful of our choices. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. What a great picture as Revelation unfolds from this point, the second half of the tribulation period, the judgments of God unleashed on Israel, the hostility of the devil unleashed against Israel, the judgments that fall on the earth over that period as God brings his final appeal to the world to say, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? That's where it all, all heads. That's what God is identifying. And then he spells out uh, unit by unit, moment by moment, plague by plague, judgment by judgment. The judgments of God on the earth till Christ comes and brings 
a more final judgment. It shouldn't be difficult to understand uh, if we embrace it for what it is and for what God says in his word regarding it. But what we want to see is Christ is the ultimate victor and those who know him enjoy wonderful victory in him. I hope you can say today, I know Christ and I know victory because I'm in Christ. Amen. Why don't we pray? Our Father, we want to thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the clear prophecy that you've uh, unfolded for us in the Scripture.